Sophia's War by Avi. Chapter 9. Mid-morning, the day cool and bright, I set out to see the printers. Many soldiers were on the streets. Missing were traders, mechanics, vendors, and clergy. And mind, the city had more than two hundred churches. Children were scarce. Citizens were dazed and wary and appeared to keep their distance from one another. What a contrast to the British soldiers. They strode about like the loud, boisterous victors they were, devils of fear and disorder. They repeatedly made ill-mannered remarks to civilians, to women more than men. Hoping to avoid their indelicacy, I worked to look the other way. I went first to Mr. Rivington's shop at the other end of Wall Street, where he had his press. He also sold books and medicines, like Bateman's Golden Spirit of Scurvy Grass, which Mother once made me take, and Dr. Ryan's incomparable worm-destroying sugar plums, which, thankfully, she did not. The place was closed, but a man who was loitering about told me Mr. Rivington was yet in London, where he had fled from the Sons of Liberty some time ago. I walked on to Hanover Square in the southern part of town, the wealthy ward. Though called a square, it was in fact triangular. Right off Queen Street, it had fine houses, both wood and brick, along with shops, business establishments, and taverns. Fortunately, it was untouched by the fire. Mr. Gain had a three-story building with a sign depicting a Bible and a crown, his mark. He and his family lived above, while the lower floor was where he had his press, which produced his newspaper, The Mercury. I walked in. The smell of printer's ink, a mix of varnish and lamp black, filled the air. Mr. Gain published books and sold goods ranging from dice boxes and paper to reading glasses, lead pencils, medicines, plus many small items of general utility. One wall bore samples of the blank legal forms that he also printed, mortgages, deeds, invoices, and the like. Another wall had upper and lower cases of type, with many small compartments. From ceiling rafters, sheets of damp paper hung in readiness for printing. The room was centered by the large wooden press with its stone form for holding the type, the crank that rolled the paper forward, and the screw and lever which pressed type to paper. On the floor was a boy on his hands and knees. As I watched, he picked up some bits and put them in a small leathern bucket that was by his side. His fingertips were black. When he paid no mind to me, I finally said, "'Good day.' The boy took note of me, sat back on his legs, and touched a finger to his forehead, leaving a black mark. "'James Penny,' he informed me. I took him to be about ten years of age, with a round, smudged face and curly brown hair. He wore no shoes. "'Is Mr. Gain here?' I asked. "'Nope.' "'Where is he?' "'Over to Jersey.' "'Has he fled?' The boy studied me before answering, as if trying to decide what to say. The thought came, no one knows whom to trust. When he spoke, it was only to say, I suppose he'll be back. When? Soon, maybe. Not sure. Who are you? What do you want? My father is Mr. Calderwood. He does copy work for Mr. Gain. The Mercury is being published by Mr. Searle these days, Lord Howe's man. I said, my father sends his respects and says he's prepared to work for your master again. Want me to tell Mr. Searle? If you'd be so kind. And if Mr. Gaines gets back, I'll tell him. The if word again. Good day, the servant boy murmured and turned back to the floor. I said, what are you doing? Picking up type. Got all dumped. Always happening. Good day, I said again and retreated. Not sure what my parents would make of this disappointing news about Mr. Gain and Mr. Rivington, I set off for home going along Willard Street. I had not gone far when I heard the tramp of feet. Turning, I saw, hedged in by armed British soldiers, a parade of ragged men. A fair number had bandages wrapped about heads or arms, some of which bore brown stains of old blood. To a man they had disconsolate looks and did not walk so much as a shuffle. I recognized a few as citizens of the town who had been active among the radicals. One, I think, was William's friend. In front of this procession marched the same portly red-haired officer I had seen leading Captain Hale to his death. Just to see him made me fear that these prisoners were to suffer the same fate as Captain Hale. 
Though I searched for my brother among the men, he was not to be found. I did wonder if anyone had news of him, but was sure I'd not be allowed to exchange words. I turned to a gentleman who, like me, had paused to watch. "'Where are they being taken?' I said. "'Off to the new jail. The Bridewell, I suspect. That's the provost, Cunningham, in the lead.' I glanced about nervously. "'What will happen to them?' "'The prisoners. No notion.' said the man, without much sympathy, I thought. My heart heavy, I watched the wretched men go by. Behind them I saw two additional British soldiers. In utter contrast to the prisoners, they were dressed with care, in scarlet coats, with blue facing, sash, and sword. They wore high busbies. The two were talking to each other with animation and laughing. As I looked on, I noticed a prisoner, who struggled somewhat behind the others. One of the officers also saw him. He drew his sword, which made me recoil, and with the flat of it struck the man on his backside, shouting, Move on, rebel! Even as he hit the defenseless prisoner, he laughed. I detested him with all my heart. When the prisoners continued to march northward, the young officer did not follow. Instead, he glanced at a piece of paper he had in his hand, saluted his fellow officer, then turned west down Maiden Lane. Though it vexed me greatly that this cruel fellow was going in the same direction I must go, there was nothing for it but to follow. Not wishing to be near, I kept back and waited for him to turn off in some direction or other. Alas, he continued to walk the same way as I, going straight until he reached Broadway. There he paused, consulted his paper, and moved toward our house. When I saw him knock upon our door, it came to me like summer thunder. This cruel British soldier must be our boarder. Chapter 10 Mother opened the door. The officer touched his hat in a salute and made a slight bow. Madam, I heard him say in a bright, cheerful fashion, your most humble servant, Lieutenant John Andre, seventh foot. Royal Fusiliers Mother stared at him in astonishment. She said, How can I help you, sir? The lieutenant held out his paper. "'It's my pleasant duty to inform you, madam, that I have been ordered by Commandant Robertson to reside here. While I have no doubt it may be somewhat inconvenient, such are the fortunes of war. I assure you, madam, it's my desire that you will find me courteous, appreciative, and no burden on your generous hospitality.' It was not a speech I expected. Mother, clearly uncertain what to do or say, stood gawking at the soldier. Then she noticed me standing on the street, looking on. "'Sophia,' she called. "'Come, our boarder has arrived.' The officer turned, and I truly saw him. He was a youngish man of middling height, olive-complexioned, with black hair and a cheerful, graceful air. Upon seeing me, he offered a bright smile, which I had to admit was frank and open. To my mother he said, "'Is this your daughter?' "'Yes, sir, she is.' "'Your servant,' he said to me with a bit of a dip." In all my life I had never been bowed to before, much less heard such polite address as a your servant. Besides, I thought myself a girl, not a lady. That said, I was flattered. Indeed, his cheerful civility put me into confusion, from which I was saved when Mother said to him, Please come in, sir. Even then the soldier paused, turned toward me, and with a polite gesture indicated that he wished me to enter first. His condescension was a further bewilderment to me, who had resolved to hate the man, Yet I could hardly remain upon the street. Instead, in what I thought was a haughty, frosty manner, childishly contrived, I walked past him and into the house. He took off his tall hat and followed. The three of us stood in the common room in momentary awkwardness. The lieutenant gazed at the sparseness and spoke to my mother with an occasional glance at me. "'Madam, I thank you for your welcome,' he said, as if he had been an invited guest." My primary regret is that it's this war, this unnatural rebellion, like some brother-to-brother -brother squabble which brings us together. My deepest desire is that our small differences will soon be peacefully resolved to the benefit of all. In the meanwhile, I am sure we can make the best of it. I am not one to rise at a feather, and when I tell you that I have only lately come from the wilds of Pennsylvania, where I was held a prisoner by a greasy committee of dullards, you may believe I am heartily delighted to be here. The kind speech flustered my thoughts. "'Thank you, sir,' Mother said. "'Shall we show you your room?' "'You are most kind.' Mother turned to me. 
Sophia, be so good that she had asked me to do the honors took me by surprise, until I grasped that she needed to inform father who had come, so as to decide what to reveal to the officer about his condition. It was I, then, who led John Andre to our upstairs room. Once there he gazed about. "'This will be fine,' he said. "'And a trundle bed. Perfect for my servant. And your name is Sophia?' "'Yes, sir,' he smiled with approval. They say His Majesty's favorite daughter has that name. Yes, sir, I answered, though I doubted that was why my parents chose it. I was gratified he liked it. How old are you? he asked. Twelve. You seem older. I felt my face flush. An only child? Though I wished he had not said child, I said, I am, sir, yes. He did not seem to notice my hesitation. Do you like music? he asked. I do, sir. Excellent. I play the flute. I shall be pleased to have you for an audience. And you must know that you are a pretty miss, and some day, if you will give permission, I will make a sketch of you. I have some talent there. You are kind, I said, a weak response to his gallant banter. And your father, he said, what occupation does he follow? A scrivener, sir. Excellent. A man of letters. Do you read and write, Sophia? Yes, sir. I have read Richardson, Fielding, and— I almost said Mr. Payne, but caught myself. Wondersome! You and I shall get on. I must admit I sometimes try to write poetry. He turned toward the steps and paused to let me go first, which I did. Mother was in the common room waiting for us. The lieutenant said, A most satisfactory accommodation, madam. Will you be moving right in? she asked. As soon as my servant can bring my things— as I said, I have just been released in a prisoner exchange. I don't have very much. This servant of yours, will he be staying here too? Peter? Of course. He made a step to the door. Sir, said Mother. John Andre paused to look at her. My husband, Mr. Calderwood, is in bed, in the back room. In all candor, sir, I must tell you, he was wounded in the fighting. A play of sorrow flitted upon the lieutenant's face. I trust he's in good health. The doctor has seen him. I am glad to hear it. Shall we agree that I won't need to know under what circumstance he received his regrettable wound? You are most kind, sir. He bowed. I wish you a good evening, madam. And John Andre went. Mother and I exchanged looks of pleasurable surprise. Perhaps, she said, we have been lucky. He plays music. I said, barely suppressing my newfound enthusiasm, and draws, and likes to read. Mother studied me. I think he's already charmed you, she said. He asked me if I was an only child. What did you say? That I was. Mother, I went on, he's not at all what I thought he'd be. In truth, I was pixie-led. Mother looked at me so fixedly I hurried into the back room to inform father that Mr. Gain was not in the city. We shall have to be patient, then he said. Sophia, it will be you who will need to search for William. Why? With this officer lodging here, it might be suspicious if your mother went out too frequently. Yes, father. At least we are here and safe. We must be proud, if quiet, that William is defending our liberties. In my thoughts, however, I was already impatient for the return of the lieutenant. Yet that was the last thing I was prepared to share with my parents. Nor did I tell them how I'd first seen John Andre.